Right. So it's about this particular plant here, uh, which is a desalination plant. I prefer to call it desalting because uh, salination implies that you're actually going to the effort of putting salt in the water, which you don't have to. Uh, so it is uh, a huge plant. It's one of the largest uh, desalting, desalination plants in the world. And it was built in Victoria, which is a, a southern state of um, Australia, whose capital is Melbourne. And um, it, has, it is a mega plant. It has a hundred capacity of 150 billion liters a, a year. And interestingly, it was built in three modules. Uh, so that the modules here are 50 billion a year. And, um, but they were built all at once. The capital cost was three and a half billion Aussie dollars, which is something around uh, two and a half billion US dollars. It's a big project. Started in 2009, um, completed in 2012, and uh, it was a, what they call a public-private partnership. That is, it was built by private investors who fronted up the capital. And it's designed to guarantee supply through uh, 2039. That is, it was built with a 30-year forecast in mind. So the, this is an example of a massive investment, initial investment to meet maximum forecast over 30 years. Maximum forecast driven by two things, uh, generally. One is by the increasing population of Melbourne itself as a really a very attractive and interesting city, a very lively. I recommend a visit to anyone. I worked on the airports there. And uh, also because of increasing effect of climate change leading to plausible uh, in, increased uh, uh, periods of drought and low water in the reservoirs. So a 30 year forecast. Now, here's the, let's think about the economics about this. So the first, so what happens is they build the plant and they keep it on tap, they maintain it, but they don't deliver any water until the uh, water authorities of the state of Victoria uh, and uh, a water board they have there uh, ask for some. So in 2016, that is four years after the opening, they placed an order for 50 billion liters, that is one third of the capacity. Uh, two years later, they put in an order for less than 50 billion. And just this year, that is uh, starting uh, in April, but basically into um, the season, the summer season, which is what we think of fall, summer, uh, fall, fall, winter, and spring, um, they wanted 50 more billion. So here what you have is a huge investment in um, that for the first, that is, so nothing, there's no return on the first three years because it's under construction. Then for the next four years, nothing happens. The first order is for one third of the total capacity. The next two orders are for at least one third the capacity, but we haven't gotten anywhere near the full capacity. So it poses the question, uh, should they have phased the modules over time? I mean, uh, so far, only two thirds the CAPEX has, been, uh, has not been needed for a decade, roughly speaking. So um, what do you think? What are your reactions to this? Now, they could say, well, a crisis could occur any time, et cetera, et cetera. But um, uh, what do you think? Any thoughts or comments about this? OK, Elias, go ahead. Oh, um, it's not a question. I was just going to say that that's an example of the forecast is always wrong. Well, I don't know if the forecast was wrong um, because it was the, the forecast wasn't timed. It sort of said they basically forecast the maximum possible demand. And we don't know if that was wrong, but um, it, um, uh, we, you know, it's uncertain. Uh, so uh, they knew it was uncertain, but the implications might have been, well, if it's going to go up by uh, to a, need 150 over all that time, maybe they should have... Uh, 
done it incrementally. I mean, the forecast might be right. They might need a, as much as the maximum at some time. So hard to say. Uh, I mean, just like uh, fire escapes uh, or, or emergency exits from a building, uh, they may never be used. Doesn't mean it wasn't a, a good idea. So having extra capacity you don't use is not necessarily bad. Um, but there's money involved in this and there are other ways to deal with low water levels. Uh, having a desalting plant is, uh, is a pretty special thing. Um, there's water rationing and other kind of things. So it's an issue. Is this, was this a good investment is, is the question I'm throwing out there. Joshua, go ahead. Hey, good morning, Professor. So are, are you saying that nine, they have capacity for 96 billion liters, but they're only really using uh, 50 billion liters? I said they had capacity for 150 billion. Oh, after construction this year in 2020? No, no, the capacity was all built, as, I, as you can see on the slide now. That was opened in 2012. For the first four years, this thing didn't do a thing. Uh, that's not necessarily bad. I mean, I have life insurance and I haven't died yet, so I'm pretty happy about that. But um, still, it was a very large, uh, and for the first decade, depending on when you start, but uh, they ha that is until 2020, they've only used up to one third of it, which happens to be one of the, just one of their modules capacity. Um, are we talking the same language or have I... We are. I, I, I thought it was uh, construction and they built it, and, but they still only had a need for 50, uh, 50 billion liters. But I, I would agree. I think that they probably overshot and could have uh, uh, built incrementally and saved a considerable amount of money. Uh, at least in terms of net present value terms. Yes, that's, the, that's what I'm uh, thinking of. Now, it turns out that the investors aren't having a hard time because um, they're getting paid um, the city is paying for them so um, because they have invested all that money and uh, it's also possible they'll never use the water. So they had a deal where the city actually pays them about 600 million a year just to keep the plant alive and to pay for the interest and the de depreciations and so forth. So the investors haven't hurt, but if it's too much construction, it means that this, uh, the city of Melbourne and the state of Victoria have overpaid. So, too much is investment, but the private investors, I think, are doing fine. Um, other comments that you say, what, Indra? Yeah, there are quite a few. Uh, Ali, next. Yeah, Professor. So, um, yeah. I, I was uh, thinking of uh, the, um, the trade-off between uh, first uh, building uh, the, the flexibility uh, and then the exponent that is um, are variable for the uh, economies of scale. Uh, so th about just the economics, but then, uh, as, as you said, there is uh, sometimes for big infrastructure, we're being paid for just having the capacity. Yes. So, and, uh, but also there can be uh, political reasons behind it, et cetera. But, so this is way beyond the, the, the economics. Well, that's right. I mean, uh, the people who, at the drought when they ordered this about 15 years ago, uh, the local uh, minister, um, the leader of the state, uh, saw this as a good thing. He was being very uh, prudent and uh, uh, there was jobs and a lot of people were happy about it. The press until about uh, 2014 was very against because there was this huge investment. I mean, for um, a relatively small area, this is a huge amount of money and it was absolutely in mothballs or it was just maintained, kept alive at a, at a cost of over $600 million a year paid by the citizens of uh, Melbourne and Victoria uh, for this. So they were less happy with that. Um, yeah, I'm, I don't, I can't give you the more of the details, but I'm just posing the question. Here it is, and what's remarkable about this case, from my perspective, is that in fact the modules of 60 bill, 50 billion uh, were part of the design. These were so, some of the most massive uh, desalting plants available at, at the time. So 
um, they felt they were already pushing the capacity for the, it's a reverse osmosis of, approach. Um, so you could easily think that maybe building 100 billion capacity in the first phase might be good. And then if you really were getting more increase, uh, more demands for it, maybe you have another module later on. So that's the question I wish to have put out on the table. I think I'll take one more question, then we'll go to our to the presentation. Uh, in um, have Jeff next. Jeff, go ahead. This is the last one. Um, I'm glad to talk about it uh, later on, but uh, for now, Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, I just have kind of two thoughts. One is uh, I've been thinking about this previously too, with like how, and I don't know how it works in the Australian government, but the federal contracting process is so long and tedious that. I feel like building flexibility to, you know, re um, add on to a project later on might be kind of a preventative measure and just building the capacity all up front makes more sense. And the second is if they built the big capacity, it could have uh, been dependent on how the environmental factors were then, you know, a drought in 2008 or whenever. Yeah, well, part of, uh, I have, a number of former students working in the government, particularly in the military, for procurement, and part of their design is this. So right now, uh, one of our students, uh, uh, Jason Bartolome, uh, who's running a huge missile project out in Utah, is basically setting up the whole program uh, for with the uh, having the bidders right at the start bid on the project in terms of demonstrating their flexibility. So they're baking it into it rather than coming at a re rethinking the procurement process in five or 10 years of making that a condition from the start. And I think that's, that's an important part of, of having the flexibility is that just you bake it into. And for those who will take in the full uh, semester course, that will be one of the issues we want to deal with. How do you go from having a good idea to implementing it properly. 